for those of you who have already joined, I appreciate it. Um, we're going to be starting here momentarily. We're just waiting for a few more people um, to join. Please stand by. Again, for those of you who have joined, I very much appreciate it. We're just waiting for a few more people to uh, join. Um, we'll start here in about two minutes. Um, so just hang on. We'll get started here momentarily. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started now. I First of all, I want to thank everyone um, for joining. Um, my name is Matt Malang. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Welcome. Uh, today, I'm here with Scott Brinker, Chief Marketing Technologist. Scott will be covering the five trends shaping the way you'll be you'll market in 2030. And more importantly, these mega trends are going to guide you on how you can run with some of these um, today. Um, so with that said, I'll let Scott take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here with you. So, um, wow, like forget about 2030 for a moment. 2020, we're almost to the end of this. Like uh, who is excited to, you know, cross that finish line? Um, I love this, uh, you know, cartoon from Tom Fishburn. Uh, uh, <laughs> kind of sums up this year, at least for me, I suspect you can relate. Can we please stop calling this the new, this, this pace of change, the new normal. <laughs> um, but at some level, it's actually been incredibly impressive how much change, particularly on the digital side, you know, that companies have been able to adapt to uh, over these past nine months. Uh, the folks at Twilio did a study. They found, uh, you know, out of 2,500 companies, 97% of them reported that you know, COVID-19, for all of its challenges, it actually sped up their digital transformation. And when asked to quantify by how much, uh, on average, about six years of acceleration. I mean, we had uh, some data from uh, the folks over at McKinsey. Uh, you know, they noticed from US e-commerce penetration that the amount of growth they saw in three months this year was equivalent to like the 10 previous years. Uh, Satya Nadella at Microsoft in an earnings call this year said that they had seen two years worth of digital transformation in just two months. Um, so it's, it, it's been pretty impressive the degree to which people have been able to adapt under these very challenging circumstances. But for those of you who are, you know, like leading marketing operations teams, you know, have a marketing operations person reporting to you, you know, this hasn't been easy, like trying to leverage the technology we have today with the operations we have today to move the world. Um, it's been quite challenging. But the good news is the capabilities here from a technology perspective and also organizationally and operations wise are really advancing. Uh, and so we'll look towards like how we expect this to go, five trends that will affect this over the next, uh, you know, decade. But most of these trends are actually already happening today. And there should be ways that you can leverage this, uh, yeah, uh, starting off in 2021. So I want to start with a, a discussion about no code, because I'm sure you've been hearing this phrase uh, quite a bit this year. Put this in perspective, 50 years ago, if you wanted to create a slide presentation, 
it was an epic production, right? People had to like have a, you know, a typesetter, like each slide was its own board, you know, it had to be laid out just perfectly by hand, you know, then a photographer come, uh, would shoot it. Eventually those photos would be converted into slides. You'd have the slide projector. I mean, it was so much work to do slide presentations that frankly, just not a lot of people did them. You know, but if you fast forward to where we are today with say Microsoft PowerPoint, I mean like, about 500 million users worldwide of PowerPoint. Uh, Microsoft estimates around 30 million PowerPoint presentations are uh, given every day. You know, and then you could, you could obviously make the joke of, well, maybe not all of those 30 million PowerPoint presentations should be given, you know, but uh, joking aside, right? I mean, we just have to recognize the democratization of visual communication that has happened here in the past 50 years is phenomenal. And the thing is, this pattern is repeating itself in so many different technologies. You know, I mean, so many technologies, they, they, they follow this mode of like starting out in a way that only the experts, you know, in those technologies can really apply them. But then as they start to improve and they start to change the way in which, uh, you know, non-discipline experts can leverage them, right? You know, more and more people are able to take advantage of what these technologies can do. And this is very much what we see happening all across the marketing technology landscape today, you know, creating a whole new generation of citizen creators, folks who are not, you know, expert programmers or expert graphic designers, but they're able to leverage these technologies, you know, to create all sorts of things that previously they would have had to, you know, like wait for an expert or hire an expert to go do. Um, you know, those of you who follow my work, you know, I'm completely obsessed with putting little logos on uh, slides. Um, you know, so I, I, I did the exercise of like, you know, just mapping out some of the many different no code tools that have been appearing here over the past couple of years and an incredible array. I mean, I just, you know, to give you a sense of like what's possible in this sort of like no code movement. I mean, there's no code tools for like building landing pages or website forms or whole websites creating interactive content, web apps, mobile apps, database apps, chatbots, voice assistant skills, you know, integrating apps through things like Zapier, uh, workflow processes, data analysis, machine learning, video creation. I'm just like scratching the surface. And these are just some of the specialized tools. So many products in the MarTech space are making it so much easier uh, for non-specialists to be able to create the assets and experiences of modern marketing. You know, now Clay Christensen, who wrote a lot about disruptive innovation, you know, has a model that actually explains this very well. Like very often when a new technology or a new mode of technology like no code comes into being, you know, it's initially solving for low end use cases. And, you know, to make this a little bit more concrete, let's talk about like, what would be a low end use case? Well, like creating a landing page for a marketing campaign is, you know, like a low end use case. If you're gonna go down this path of like, okay, well, web content or web experience, like maybe a partner directory, a little more sophisticated than a landing page, that's like a mid range use case. And I guess if you were gonna like build an entire e-commerce site for, you know, like a dedicated, you know, D2C brand, right? This would be a very high end use case. And the thing is, you know, in these low end use cases in particular, they're mostly unserved by expert or expert solutions because, I mean, let's face it, your experienced web developer does not want to spend his or her day creating a bunch of landing pages for the marketing team, you know? And so this is kind of a really great opportunity for these no code tools where they've risen up, you know, is for these low end use cases, you know, that the experts probably don't want to spend their time on or it doesn't make economic sense for them to do, they can solve that. But what's exciting is, you know, this, this pattern of disruptive innovation is almost always these technologies that disrupt things, they keep improving and they start to be able to serve higher end use cases. Now, does this mean like we won't need any, uh, you know, expert web developers in the next 10 years? No, but the number of cases that the general business user, the marketer will be able to do on their own will continue to grow. And then for the experts, as these tools get more and more sophisticated, they will take more advantage of them, frankly, just as a way to optimize their work. All right, so very, very cool thing. There's a lot of these tools available today. Um, I think you're gonna see a lot more that empower you in the decade ahead. 
Now, this kind of flows into a discussion about uh, another set of patterns that we're seeing so much of these days of uh, platforms, networks, and marketplaces. Uh, and uh, maybe I can start with like a definition uh, of what, uh, what these are, because these terms get thrown around a lot. But for this context, we'll talk about platforms as like software platforms that then allow specialization or variations of things to be created or plugged in on top of them. You know, and that might be apps or campaigns or creative or workflow, you know, but the advantage of all these different things that are being created, you know, they all have that common foundation that provides uh, some coherence across them. And then like welcome is a perfect example, you know, of a platform. Uh, an, another term we see a lot of is, you know, networks, uh, you know, so social networks are, of course, the ones that come to mind the most, you know, anything for like using digital channels to facilitate connections, interactions, asset sharing um, among participants in a community. And so, yeah, this applies for Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, but it also applies to things like Slack uh, that we might use internally for our own network inside our company or connected with other partners. Um, it can be communities we create uh, for our customers to engage with us. And then we get into marketplaces, which are kind of a specialization of the other two where you've got these you know, networks, but there's producers creating things and consumers who are consuming them. You know, and marketplaces are a kind of platform that like helps make those connections. You know, and we see a ton of these examples for like everything from Apple's App Store, or Android Play Store, or um, Airbnb, uh, Uber. Um, and the thing that's cool about this from a pattern perspective is in marketing, we see these patterns of platforms and networks and marketplaces just popping up everywhere in our work. I mean, we're certainly, certainly relying on them for how we engage with suppliers to the marketing org. Um, you know, it might be that we are purchasing, you know, platforms. It might be that we're using, uh, you know, networks as a way to, uh, you know, source talent, uh, you know, on-demand resources through marketplaces. We then also see these patterns uh, inside the marketing organization, right? How we run, you know, a particular platform or a network like Slack or even starting to see a few cases of, you know, like these internal marketplaces that are kind of cool too. And then of course, this is how we engage very often with our audience and customers, uh, you know, externally is whether it's like engaging through other platforms and networks that exist out there or even creating our own, our own custom uh, communities. And I wanna take just a moment here, you know, cause again, like for the, for the marketing operations world, you know, this, this way of thinking about platforms and networks as the way we run our own marketing organization is cool for a number of reasons, but one of which is these patterns help us balance both the benefits of centralizing, you know, control inside our organization, while at the same time also empowering decentralization of what people, you know, throughout the organization on the edge of the marketing organization can do. And I know you're thinking, well, but wait a second, like centralize and decentralize, like how can you do both of those things at the same time? And again, it's actually, this is, this is the magic of what things like, you know, platforms like Welcome help you do, right? You know, the centralized platform provides that governance, that infrastructure, you know, way of enforcing standards and making sure that, you know, you've got global control over what's happening throughout the marketing org. But at the same time, by the interface they have to let so many people people participate in them in that controlled fashion with these good guardrails, right? It empowers more adaptations and innovations and people to do local control where it's really valuable. So yeah, if we were used to like debating like more centralization or more decentralization, you know, I mean, the great thing about platforms, networks and marketplaces, they kind of let us get both. Now, platforms is actually a good segue to talk about another thing we see happening all throughout marketing, the great app explosion. Now, you know, when I say the great app explosion, what might come to mind is, you know, this crazy landscape I've uh, done over the years. Um, here's actually a, you know, marketer, you know, in the wild attempting to uh, use this landscape. Um, and I mean, it's grown incredibly, right? I mean, from 2011 to 2020, you know, this grew like 5,233%. I mean, incredible. Now you might be saying, okay, well, 
obviously that is the great app explosion in marketing. But um, yeah, we'll bring in the meme here. Hold on to your butts because actually that MarTech landscape is really just the tip of the iceberg. The folks at IDC estimate that over 500 million digital apps and services will be developed and deployed using cloud native approaches just by 2023. As we start to think out to like 2030, this idea of like a billion, five billion apps, not, a, not out of the realm of possibilities. You know, and of course, you know, I mean, there's a subset of these that will be commercial software, packaged apps that we purchase, uh, things that are available in the app stores. Um, but frankly, a whole bunch more of this will be custom apps. You know, the things that we're building custom for our website and interactions we have with our customers there, or, you know, through mobile apps or through like internal workflow apps. And I think one way, uh, you know, to sort of wrap your head around what's happening here is all this stuff, you know, that is happening in the cloud. We can kind of look at it as a spectrum where on one end, you've got general purpose infrastructure. Uh, and on the other end, you've got business specific logic. So like the general purpose infrastructure of cloud platforms, this is what we think of for like, you know, AWS or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, custom apps, right? These are the individual software things we build for our business with our website or a mobile app or, you know, some sort of, you know, internal workflow app. What gets interesting though, is along that spectrum, you know, you've got a bunch of things in the middle. You've got, okay, service platforms, uh, things like Twilio for communications or Stripe for payment processing that are again, primarily geared like Azure and AWS for developers to help them be able to build other apps faster. On top of that, you then get to, you know, for what we as marketers and business users generally run into, which are these app platforms, you know, that combine a whole bunch of capability for a particular domain, you know, like uh, Welcome or Salesforce or HubSpot or Shopify, you know, all sorts of really great app platforms out there. But they're not just, you know, packaged apps for business users to take advantage of right away. You know, most of them also have APIs to help other developers extend on top of them. And then that gets us into this world of all these specialist apps, you know, which if you think of my MarTech landscape, you know, in that 8,000 apps from 2020, most of them are highly specialized apps. They're not platforms themselves, but they're leveraging these cloud platforms and service platforms and app platforms to really be able to, you know, then quickly build and serve a specific need for a specific audience. You know, so when we think about all these crazy apps, you know, it is worth sort of looking at this, you know, across this definition. You know, um, the folks at Slash Data, you know, a, a developer community, they estimate there's around 20 million software developers today, and they expect that to be 45 million by 2030. So you can, I mean, the more developers that are out there in the world, the more apps that are going to create be created. So even just looking at these numbers, we can say, wow, all these developers leveraging those cloud platforms and service platforms and app platforms. I mean, my goodness, it's just going to be a ton, you know, of apps coming our way. But it's even more than that, because if we go back to that first trend about, you know, these no code platforms, right? They're even now allowing more and more of us non-software developer business users to kind of create our own apps too, you know? And again, you know, not all apps are created equal, but this idea of having this explosion of all these different specialized apps and increasingly using these platforms as a way to orchestrate across them. Uh, we're already seeing this in place, uh, you know, today, uh, but over the next 10 years, this is just going to be a phenomenal vector by which marketers create and engage uh, with our audiences. Now, <laughs> with all these apps flying around and all this stuff, uh, this, this then you know, moves uh, very nicely into this next trend about the shift from big data to big ops. So for a long time, people have said data is the new oil, which I have to say, it's not, I, I don't really like that metaphor. Um, you know, I mean, first of all, oil is kind of gooey and yucky. Um, but, uh, you know, also, yes, it's valuable, 
but it's kind of a commodity. It's like we treat oil like it's, it's you know, interchangeable. I think a better metaphor here is to say data is the new oil paint for a couple of reasons. First of all, oil paint has actually a pretty wide range of values itself, even in its raw form. I mean, you can buy you know, a tube of oil paint at your local art supply store that would cost you $6. But there are tubes of oil paint that are much rarer that, I mean, like here, let's take old Holland classic oil, you know, uh, tube of cadmium orange ooh, on sale for $264 for a tiny little tube of that. Oh, and by the way, you get free shipping. So that totally makes it worth well. You know, so this is actually a little bit closer because right, the data we have in our organizations, right, it has a high range of value too. But the reason I like this metaphor even more is because it's not just about the raw value of data. You know, I mean, with paint, it's not the cost of the oil paints. I mean, the real magic happens is when you apply those paints, you know, to canvas and create these masterpieces, you know, that now we're not talking about tens or hundreds of dollars. We can be talking about things that are millions of dollars in value. Now, don't get me wrong. The amount of data in these, our organizations is just continuing to explode and grow. Uh, you know, that IDC report estimates that even just within the next four or five years, it'll be like 175 zettabytes. Um, wouldn't zettabyte be a great name for a band? You know, 175 like zettabytes, you know, of data inside the global data sphere. But one of the challenges we even have with this today is like 44% of the data that's flowing through our organizations right now isn't even being captured. And out of the data that we do capture, something like 43% of it remains unused. You know, so again, this is a bit of a challenge, but the flip side of that is it's an incredible opportunity for us starting in 2021, but also continuing to grow in the decade ahead to really look at both how we advance our distillation of data you know, this moving from data in its raw form, you know, to distilling it into true information and knowledge and insights. And on another dimension, data activation, how we move from just like trying to to our decision-making process and we embed it into our operational execution. And it's the combination of these two things that is really how we get unlock data value. We can think of the top part of this graph as like our data intelligence capabilities and the bottom half of this graph as our data reflexes. I choose the term reflexes very intentionally uh, because right, it's not just about making decisions on data at human time scale, like, oh, okay, well, I got that insight from last month's report and now I've made a decision about what we're gonna do next month. That's a part of it, you know, but it's even more as we're leveraging more automation and more AI algorithms to be able to set up the structures that when data happens in real time, you know, our organization is able to automatically respond to many, many more scenarios that are appearing through it. And I mean, this is, again, this is a balance of challenge and opportunity. If the past 10 years was a big talk about big data, like, you know, how do we deal with the scale and complexity of all this data that's being collected and stored and analyzed, the exciting opportunity moving forward is more of big ops, like the scale and complexity of all the processes and apps and automations and machine learning algorithms, you know, that we have interacting with that data at the same time. And interacting with data is right, this is all that data activation side of things, you know, pulling another figure from that IDC report, you know, the number of interactions that people have with data is exploding exponentially as well too. You know, I mean, this year will be on the order of about, you know, like 1500, you know, interactions on average per person, just within the next four to five years, they expect that to be almost 5,000. And so our challenges, you know, inside marketing and marketing operations in particular, you know, is how we balance these things. It's almost like uh, if you, you've probably heard of DevOps, you know, in the software development world, you know, this uh, whole set of methodologies and tools, you know, for really uh, automating and simplifying and improving, you know, how software gets created and deployed in the cloud world. 
And certainly in, you know, marketing, we've heard a lot about, you know, RevOps of, you know, how we really look at connecting the whole customer journey pipeline, you know, processes and workflows, the metrics, you know, the business intelligence that comes out of that. What's really exciting is to recognize that we're heading into this world where these two things have a lot more in common, like DevOps and RevOps are sort of the core components of what this whole big ops thing is about. You know, and it shares across these, you know, uh, domains, like kind of the same principles of let's automate, you know, let's get the right systems in place. Let's make sure we're harnessing data properly, that we've got the analytics for it, that we've got good governance. You know, in fact, actually, if you sort of like pull back the cover on, um, you know, like the whole ops movement, I mean, there's all sorts of specialized ops happening, uh, you know, inside organizations today. There's, you know, AI ops, there's, you know, product ops, there's web ops. And frankly, again, all of these things kind of feed into this pattern of how do we orchestrate these together as a competitive advantage in big ops. You know, and again, this is one of the super exciting things about Welcome. I, you can see it as a platform. I know Matt will share a little bit more about this in a bit, but you know, it's a platform that can help provide the automation systems, data analytics and governance to be able to bring these domains together and effectively uh, execute on them. All right, so the last topic I wanted to get to before we uh, you know, have some time for Q&A. And I should say, like, if you have questions, uh, you know, there's a Q&A option uh, here in Zoom. You're probably very familiar with by <laughs> this point in time in 2020. Uh, feel free to throw in some questions uh, there. Uh, we'll see uh, if we can get to as many of them as possible. But I'd like to close the presentation talking about this last trend of harmonizing human and machine. Now, the balance we have today, you know, where the work we have machines doing and the work we as human marketers are doing, we kind of feel like, all right, yeah, you know, we're, we're holding our own. In fact, actually, we probably wish the machines would do more for us. But when you start talking about AI, you know, people, you know, there are all sorts of, you know, scary scenarios of like, oh, well, as these machines just get better and better at doing more and more of these things, is this just going to eliminate the needs for me as a human marketer to contribute? You know, am I going to have this machine that's like, why are you touching the campaign, Dave? This is highly irregular. Uh, I have the utmost confidence in the campaign. Um, I actually don't, I mean, as amusing as this scenario can be, uh, you know, I, I don't see that. Um, I think it's actually going to look a lot more like this. That yes, we are going to be able to rely on machines to do more and more for us. But this is going to free up so much human potential for us, you know, both at the level of the capabilities those, uh, you know, machine based tools will give us. I mean, some of the things we were talking about at the beginning with no code tools, right, this ability, you know, to imbue the general purpose marketer with all these, you know, superpowers. Oh, my goodness, the things you'll be able to create with that are just going to be astounding. But also because as we take more of the manual work that we've all had to deal with and we can push more of that into automations and AI, it will free more time for us to do other things, like more time to talk with customers, more collaboration with peers, more creative experimentation, more learning and teaching, more focus on leadership. Heck, just more time to think. Like, wouldn't that be great if you could get an hour back on your calendar for every day? This is my thinking hour. Not kidding, right? Because this is actually what leads to more innovation. You know, I showed you that uh, graph earlier in the no-code stuff, uh, the Clay Christensen disruptive innovation. It's really the same model that's happening here with AI. You know, right now, a lot of the things that AI is helping marketers to do are frankly tasks that wouldn't even have been worth us doing manually. Um, you know, like a great example would be like send time optimization for email, if you've ever used that, right? This idea of like, okay, I wanna send this email to a thousand people, you know, can I find the ideal best time to send it to each person? I mean, there's no way a human would want, hey, okay, let me see about Joe. How about we send that to him at seven? And, you know, Mary, we could send this to her at 735. No, but to turn it over to like a machine learning algorithm, you know, that can figure out those patterns and just do it for us, of course, piece of cake. You know, we see this appearing in more things like, you know, long tail keyword optimization. Um, you know, even if you look at some of the latest stuff that's happening, like with GPT-3 and, you know, these AIs that can generate content, very impressive stuff. 
you know, it's not that this is going to take away, you know, all the creative, you know, capabilities marketers do, but think about all the things we'd love to create, but we just don't have time for. I mean, like, you know, case studies, you know, if we could do, uh, apply an AI to help us, you know, write more case studies faster and then provide the editorial judgment, you know, as a human marketer on top of it, just, just amazing stuff. And so the model I'd kind of like to leave with you, leave you with, uh, you know, in your head here, is looking at these possibilities through two axes. Um, anything that can be explained by a two by two is good stuff, uh, right? You know, there's things that become more human, and there are things that become more automated. You know, now in this two by two, the lower left would be things that aren't very automated, but frankly, don't really take much advantage of, uh, you know, our human talents or capabilities either, right? Like if you've ever spent time, you know, cutting and pasting, you know, emails or data and, you know, Excel spreadsheets, you're like, yeah, this is not a great use of time. So certainly a lot of those use cases are things where when we've been able to apply a more automation to go from manual to mechanized, you know, that's great, a rules-based engine to like automatically reply to certain kinds of, um, you know, messages or, you know, use something to quickly be able to move data from one app to another. But there's also things that, you know, we can lean into that aren't automated, they're more human, but they become really meaningful through that. You know, and I would argue the best example of this is anytime a marketer has a one-on-one -on -one conversation empathetically with a real customer, right? There's a magic that happens there, both for us and our customer, then AI isn't going to replace. But what gets exciting is we're moving into an era where these things don't have to be mutually exclusive, that we can look to leverage more and more AI-based tools, you know, to be able to help find the best opportunities for us to apply, you know, our human talents, uh, you know, uh, like an example here, like, right, you have all these different digital touch points, the more we're relying on AI to detect patterns where there are anomalies, you know, someone having a problem, you know, and the AI might not be able to completely figure out what that problem is or how to solve it for that customer, but to alert, you know, a marketer or a customer support person right away who can jump in to help. Right, this is where it starts to get magical. We're getting the best of you know, AI and the best of being human. And this is gonna be a chance for all of us to write the new collaborative playbooks between humans and machines in modern marketing. So as you could probably tell, I am super excited about you know, where things are today, but even more so where they're headed. Uh, if I was gonna pick a label for this, I'd say we're entering the age of the augmented marketer. You know, the, the, the bionic marketer, all these tools that, you know, give us these superpowers while still retaining, you know, the heart and the creativity and the insight and the intuition, you know, that we uniquely bring. And so that this combination, as it continues to get better and better over these years ahead, we're going to move from, you know, where it's been today that it's still quite a struggle to more and more where, you know, this technology will be able to let us move the world through this organized big ops capability. Uh, so I'm gonna crib from Archimedes, you know, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Uh, this is the future of marketing and MarTech and the future has already started. So, Matt, <laughs> tell us about, uh, welcome uh, in this world of big ops. Yeah, so let me first thank you for all that awesome information. Um, it's always thought provoking. It always gets my wheels turning. And I hope you don't mind, Scott, I'm gonna steal like 90% of this material. <laughs> <laughs> <It's the greatest laughs> honor. Today, I just wanted to walk through like some practical applications of what Scott just went through and the context of the challenges that marketers face. Because at the end of the day, as Scott pointed out, Welcome is a platform. It's a platform that was built for the purpose of freeing up marketers to do marketing. Whether it's COVID or not, I mean, we have seen a massive acceleration um, in the use of Welcome, um, over 300% since COVID started. But what Welcome is really doing is we're taking away, we're not trying to automate what marketers do, we're trying to automate what they don't wanna do, right? All those mundane tasks, those endless meetings, awkward approval processes, trying to spend all that time aligning um, plans and strategy to the execution. And we do that through a platform. Scott, if you could skip, skip to the next slide. 
So again, I'm, I'm still in a little bit of this from Scott's, but I'm going to put the welcome spin on it because I think it's really relevant. I've always maintained that content and assets the marketers create are still the king. It's, the, it's, the, it's our oil paint, right? That's what we do. But we also have playbooks that we keep in our head. And these playbooks might be a webinar or it might be a white paper or it might be content marketing, communication or PR, how we're gonna handle our PR, our PR efforts. At the end of the day, marketers are using content and creative assets and assets to influence the world. But we find how difficult it is to align these strategy and plans to the teams that are responsible for executing. And then when the assets are created, we find it's still a challenge to get those assets into the world, right? Through the channels and communication channels. We struggle to know what's working and what's not working, largely because of the difficulty with the data and the silos that we've built for ourselves. And we have core MarTech tools that we use, like Eloquas and Marketos and HubSpots. But how do you take all the work that you're doing and get it to where it needs to be fairly seamlessly? And so when you think about what we're trying to accomplish is yes, our goal is to free marketers up to do marketing. And the way we accomplish this is by giving a platform whereby marketers have marketing-wide visibility in terms of the plans that they have, campaigns and content. And they're built for marketers and that they can build calendars specific to their needs. Maybe you need a PR calendar, maybe you need a global calendar, a communications calendar, content marketing calendar. They're meant to be flexible because every marketing organization is not the same. They have different goals, they have different objectives. Some are B2B, some are B2C. Then as we begin to execute, there's a lot of collaboration from ideation to the actual production of all these assets. These assets are things like content and creative and the you know brochures and Booths, the list goes on. And you need collaboration tools that help marketers work better. This is particularly true in COVID, right? So how do you go from being able to get into a meeting and whiteboard to be able to whiteboard kind of, a, you know, when you're working in different locations? And those are the very type of collaboration tools that we're building within the platform itself. We help ensure that there's the workflows and the automated workflows are in place. So once you define what you want your workflows to be, you're not going to miss reviews and approvals. You don't have to, you know, wake up in the middle of the night sweating that you forgot to get it off to your brand compliance team or your legal team. You can't miss it because it's automated. Then we provide an integrated digital asset management tool because it needs to go somewhere because people need to be able to find it. You need to store it. You need to make it findable. You need to be able to report on it. And some marketers are like, well, I don't need a integrated digital asset management tool because I have this other one that's enterprise. I'm like, that's maybe true, but you need a place to put it and we'll be happy to provide an integration into that your enterprise digital asset management tool as well. And the way we go about this is you got to think of the platform ultimately is like Play-Doh because we built an integration framework to work for your organization. This allows you to tie in your content to publish it out to channels fairly seamlessly, whether those channels might be like um, SEO channels, or it might tie into core marketing automation tools in your MarTech stack, like your Marketo or your HubSpot. Because your workflow needs to interface with key channels and needs to interface with key um, channel so that you can work well together and get rid of those mundane tasks that don't add value because the value is in your creativity, is your ability to analyze what's working and what's not. And yes, there's value created from meetings, but what if effectively you're automating some of that through visibility, through plans, through status dashboards? And where the real power of welcome comes into play is when you look at your success data, right? whether it's your content ROI or other metrics that you care about, 
you want to take those campaigns that didn't work and dump them. But then you want to take those that did work and basically rinse and repeat. So put them in a template and now you're just automating all those mundane tasks. And guess what? You do, do it once and you're done because the, you can iterate on it if you want. But at the end of the day, the steps you have to go through, the teams you need to interact with, the workflows you need to think about, the planning that needs to occur, the bigger the organization, the harder this gets. But even in companies the size of Welcome, we use it all day long because even as a CMO, 10 people makes it difficult for me to know what's going on where. And so this is what Welcome's trying to accomplish. Um, and it's very much speaks to a lot of the trends and kind of put a wrapper on this. And I put this cheesy welcome brush over here on uh, um, Leonardo, but the assets you have, the creatives you create, the ideation that occurs really has no value until you do something with it. And you can't just do something with it because you're just one team or one person, you need to work in harmony as a team. You need to orchestrate as a marketing organization. And when you do that, all of a sudden your marketing kind of turns into something like Salvatore Mundi. Um, and the value of what you're doing increases by a ma massive magnitude. Um, so there's a practical application of um, this. Uh, we're not gonna drop off just yet. There's some really great questions that come, came in. Um, Scott, I'm going to start off by just kicking a few of these around. Um, Great. This one came from Ashley. I'm just going to start from the top. And some were sent in the other day as well. Um, but she says, how would you say marketing has changed during COVID? And do you see more marketing events taking place virtually? And we, even when we go back to normal? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I mean, certainly uh, from an external perspective, I think, uh, you know, one of the things virtual events has been teaching us is, while yes, we lose something relative to the in-person, you know, networking and serendipity that, you know, all those conferences and trade shows brought us, one of the other things we get from the virtual events is, you know, the convenience, you know, the ability to reach audiences who weren't going to be able to, you know, like travel, you know, and take days out of the office and do that for every possible event. I mean, uh, I know even with, you know, some of the events, uh, you know, my team runs, like we've getting participation from people all around the world who never would have been able to come to like a physical event in Boston, let's say. But um, I think when we move, move forward, what's really exciting is this promise of, well, wait a second, it doesn't necessarily have to be either or. And I think a lot of the creativity that you see happening in the events and virtual event space is gonna give us some new capabilities for better running these hybrid events where you can kind of get the best of both worlds. So I think that's gonna be a, a very exciting and creative dimension of this uh, you know, when we get into 2021 and beyond. Um, but one other thing I just would add here, right? It's not just about how we engage externally, uh, you know, with our audiences that have changed in COVID, but, you know, this whole digital transformation thing, it's as much how we've been adapting the way our teams work internally too, you know, and leveraging software like, uh, you know, welcome to be able to make it easier, you know, to coordinate across distributed teams and decentralized teams. Uh, and I think that's also something that we will very much continue to take advantage of uh, even once uh, the COVID craziness has passed. Yeah, and I would just add, Ashley, I could argue it either way. On a personal level, I'm dying to go back to an event. Um, maybe I'll be at the next Adobe Summit when they finally have one. Um, I find it a great way to just interact with people and learn new things, but at the same time, check out for my day-to-day -day job. But I promise you, we'll run a survey. We love writing surveys here at Welcome. We'll run a survey. I'll make sure we ask that question. And if you tune in, maybe in like uh, January or February, we'll have the answer for you, at least in terms of what other marketers think. Um, from Emily, for those of us who has messy data systems and apps that aren't integrated, that sounds pretty common, um, and no unified marketing theory for our organization, not uncommon, where should we start? What's the first thing we should do? What's the first tool we should invest in? Now, I, let me take a first stab at this, which is I think change always starts with leadership. 
And we did an interesting webinar with Charlene Lee a few weeks ago. But leadership doesn't need to start from the top down. It can start from the bottom up. And so everyone has a voice. Everyone has the power to help make change. But I think at the end of the day, there first has to be a willingness to do something different and do it better. And so that's where I would start the question. I'll let Scott take it from here. No, I think that's a great, uh, great view on it, Matt. I think um, one thing that can help when you're trying to like, you know, move a, um, a folks higher up in the organization, you know, to, you know, uh, endorse some of these changes is that as much as you can help like attribute, you know, revenue to these opportunities or missed opportunities. Like when you see like, okay, well, this is, you know, a set of channels or a set of campaigns. This is how long it takes us to run these, put them together, execute them. You know, this is the impact. If we can combine just these two systems or these two or three processes, this is how we could shorten this. We could like, you know, increase, you know, the number of, you know, campaigns or distinct segments we're going after, you know, by 40% and just start to model this out. Like, cause at the end of the day, the reason like we integrate these things and we orchestrate this stuff, you know, is not because it's cool diagrams on a PowerPoint slide. Uh, it's because at the end of the day, this actually impacts business performance. Uh, and I think those models can be pretty compelling. I completely agree. Um, so let me, you know, we're getting pressed on time here. I'm going to hit, um, in fact, we're a little bit over time, but I'm going to answer um, or at least bring up at least two more questions, Scott, and then we'll call it a day for at least in consideration of your time and other people's time. But um, please talk about the differences or similarities, similarities between B2C and B2B in the future. Yeah, you know, I mean, there are differences, but I think one of the things that had already been happening before COVID and COVID certainly seems to have accelerated is even within the B2B context, recognizing like just how much this comes down to engaging individuals in the accounts that you're trying to close. Um, and so actually I, I when, when we uh, were running the MarTech conference in person, one of the reasons we would always blend the B2B and B2C uh, you know, together is because I think B2B marketers can learn a lot uh, from B2C marketers and uh, vice versa as well too. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd look for more, uh, more similarities and connective tissue, uh, you know, more so than saying, oh, well, do this for consumers and do this for businesses. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. So we do look at a lot of survey data and we always ask questions, you B2B, B2C, B2B to C. And at the end of the day, like the pain points marketers face are fairly similar irrespective of like what their business model is. You know, they fall in areas of planning and coordination. Now this obviously is very specific to the context of welcome. But my theory is, is wherever there's pain, there's going to be a solution. And so as long as marketers have similar pains, you'll continue to see solutions trying to solve those pain points. Um, so I, I do agree with Scott. I think there's probably more similarities um, than probably differences. Um, and lastly, um, this is an interesting one. How will you see data tracking evolve? Do you see consumer behavior becoming more or less viable that came from Nora yeah I mean uh, <laughs> that, that's definitely a question that we could do a you know a whole webinar uh, on to even try and do it justice um, but I think the high level of this is leaning into like good privacy practices and, you know, customer preferences of how they want to engage with us and the communications cadences around these, you know, as, as, as we first started getting hit with this stuff a few years ago, particularly with GDPR, you know, I think most marketers, um, yeah, felt like, oh, no, this is one more set of like restrictions and hurdles that we have to wrestle with, you know, to accomplish our jobs. But I think most marketers who have really started to lean into this recognize that there's actually a lot of upside to this, you know, uh, that the better we get to empowering customers and prospects, you know, to control, you know, the way in which we engage with them with their preferences, right? First of all, the more likely we are to actually engage with them in a way that makes them happy rather than ticking them off, you know, but also we found like the quality of data 
you know, that we've got uh, has generally improved quite a bit, you know, from these practices. And that's so helpful for, you know, going back to one of the trends from this webinar here, you know, all this machine learning AI capability, you know, that's coming to, you know, bear, at the end of the day, it's not so much the algorithm as much as the data that gets fed into those algorithms, you know, that helps us achieve our outcomes. And it is a classic garbage in, garbage out sort of thing. So I think, you know, investments in really like having our data accurately reflect how customers are behaving and how they want to engage with us, um, yeah, becomes a great lever, you know, for taking advantage of these machine learning and AI capabilities more effectively. Yeah. And I, I would add to this one, which is if you create value from that data, then it becomes more valuable. So for example, like if you can get recommendation on movies that actually would be other movies you'd be interested in, that's creating value, right? And where there's value being created, I think people are more willing to allow for their data to be collected because they're getting value from it. Um, you know, I, I like to shop on Wayfair. Um, they do a great job of recommending other things I would like. And they ask me, is it okay to send me text messages when some of my stuff is delivered? And I'm more than willing to give it to them because that's actually creating value for me, right? It's notifying me of when these things have arrived. And I should probably go to my doorstep um, and pick it up before it gets covered in uh, rain or snow. So I think part of it, it comes down to how well we actually apply that data. And I think AI is a means to doing that um, because it allows us to figure out and um, guide us on what's gonna create value for people. So I wanna thank everyone for your time today. There was many more questions. There was no way I was gonna get through them all. Um, again, I appreciate everyone staying on. I hope you found it useful and uh, never feel shy. If you want to reach out, um, you could probably uh, find me in one of those 10 databases that exist. <laughs> I appreciate your time today. Thank you, everyone. Take care.